Welcome back from the break. We now have our third presentation for today. Uh, and joining us from uh, Cairns via Zoom is Marlene Levasseur from Rights in Action. So thanks very much for joining us, Marlene. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for, being, for letting me be here today. Would you like to, just for the purpose of the public record, Marlene, just identify yourself and your organisation? Uh, my name is Marlene Levasseur. I'm a disability advocate at Rights in Action in Cairns. Thank you, Marlene. I'll hand over to you to make your presentation. Right. Um, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the Elders past, present and future. And I would like to just do a bit of an introduction first. Firstly, Rights in Action are grateful uh, to QPC to be given the opportunity to be present today. As on the ground disability advocates with strong links to our local community in Northern Queensland, we feel that we have a lot of information to offer QPC in terms of our practical, hands-on, real experience of dealing with people living with disability in our region, the barriers faced by them and the rewards by accessing the NDIS. Because our advocacy services are unable to meet the demand in our region, we target the most vulnerable by undertaking a risk assessment known as the spectrum of vulnerability. For example, the person has no natural allies is isolated and at risk. We have been witness to many serious cases of neglect and exploitation of people with disability in our region. This has led us to making numerous submissions to the Disability Royal Commission and the making of complaints to the NDI's Quality and Safeguards Commission. We also have a good relationship with the Cairns Local Police, who have referred some of these serious cases of neglect and exploitation to our office. I'm just going to keep going on. It's a bit of a, a bit of a long introduction, and I know that I've only got 30 minutes, so I'm going to skip the next slide and just go into what's going to be covered today. I've got I've got six points. Um, all of these points are, are gleaned out of the submission that I made to the QPC. I've made two submissions to date. Um, the first topic is mothers with intellectual disability and their children with the same disability and interactions with government services. The second topic to, topic is a general comment on NDI data collection, primary versus secondary disability. The third is comments to, on the QPC uh, topic of improving participant outcomes and reviewable decisions and appeals at 5 and 5.5 of their draft report. The next one is going to be comments on the QPC information request, ways in which the contribution of general practitioners' outcomes could be increased. That's at page 119 of your draft report. Five, comments on the QPC topic of interactions with government services and using government institutions to support access at 14 and 14.4 of the draft report. Then item six will be comments on the division of disability services between governments, QPC box 14.3 information requests on specific adverse impacts of cost shifting outside the applied principles and tables of support. And then I'll be summing up briefly and um, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions as we go along today as well. So feel free to interrupt me if you want to. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the first topic is mothers with intellectual disability and, and children with the same disability and, and interactions with government services. In particular, rights and action are concerned about the state's cost burden of mothers with intellectual disability and their children with the same disability being overrepresented in the state's child protection system. There are situations where children removed from their mothers have access to the NDIS, but not their mothers. Our concern is also linked to the negative outcomes of mothers and children being part of that system, such as trauma, isolation, and ongoing mental health issues. These mothers and children are not having their rights and needs met as they are entitled to under International Convention, the Human Rights Act, and the Anti-Discrimination Act Queensland. This is in part due to failures of interactions with government services and the many issues to be addressed for these mothers and children, not just gaining access to the NDIS. As advocates acting for these mothers and children, we are witness to numerous breaches of key provisions, key protections on a regular basis, which can be due to intergovernmental demarcation lines, a lack of understanding of a person's human and disability rights, overlaid with discriminatory behaviour. There's some perception that mothers with intellectual dis disability are unable to parent. Excuse me, it's going to have to be <laughs> Rights and action are of the view that we can have reduced the state's cost burden on the child protection system, mental health services, and others by advocating for these mothers and children by building capacity and addressing all their needs and issues, such as housing, health, education, 
finances, settlement payments, child support, other legal matters, QCAT applications for the appointment of a guardian and the public trustee, NDIS matters including access, pre-planning, planning, engagement of services, review of services, reviewable decisions and appeals. An example of the complexity of issues to be addressed by advocacy for these mothers is set out in our, sub our submission at Appendix A, um, our Rights in Action Case Study um, MD, which is at page 14 of our submission. We are also of the view that these issues cannot be addressed by simplification of the NDIS and streamlining of intergovernmental services because the issues faced by these mothers and children are complex and many. That is, there's a need for strong skilled advocacy, advocacy to enable all the stakeholders to be pulled together to achieve the best outcomes and act in the best interests of the mother and the child. Mothers with intellectual disability are not able to navigate those multiple services successfully without advocacy. They have no power. They find it difficult, difficult to articulate their needs or bargain for them and many are unable, unable to read or write or use information technology. Um, that's my first topic over. As, does anyone have any questions on that issue that I've just read or that, that topic I've just read? Marley, we might hold questions until the end just so you have time to get through your slides. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to the second topic now, which is a, a rights and action general comment on NDIA data collection, primary versus secondary disability. There's an inherent flaw on NDI uh, primary data disability collection due to only one primary disability being able to be recorded against a participant's record. This is a, a systemic issue leading to NDIS access being denied, plans issuing with inadequate funding, which then leads to requests for internal review or external review to the AAT. This data collection flaw impacts upon how QPC interprets primary disability data provided by the NDA, NDIA because it is simply inaccurate, impacts on participants and takes up valuable resources in terms of advocacy, legal aid, the NDIA and the AAT. I'm just going to move on to my next topic now, which is improving participant outcomes and reviewable decisions appeals at 5 and 5.5 of QPC's draft report. Rights in Action to date have had a 100% success rate on NDI's internal reviews and AAT appeals. The clients that we have represented on NDIS reviewable decisions and AAT appeals are unable to self-advocate or rep represent themselves on NDIA internal and external reviews in the AAT because of the nature of their disability. Once again, I refer QPC to the case studies of Appendix B, page 19 of our submission. Legal Aid currently only receives federal funding for one NDI lawyer for all of Northern New South Wales and Queensland. The bar to access legal aid is extremely high and they lack capacity to take matters on. Rights in Action have skilled legal advocates who undertake this work and act as representatives to fill this gap and to ensure that people with serious disability who are unable to advocate for themselves have access to justice. Our federal funding for this work has been reduced to 75% and we aren't able to keep up with the demand for our service in our region. State funding for this type of advocacy work would fill the gap and ensure access to justice for vulnerable people. With our advocacy, vulnerable people with disability in our region have much better outcomes on reviewable decisions and appeals, which means they do not fall back onto the state mental health, child protection, disability services, services and the criminal justice system because they gain access and have their reasonable and necessary support needs met under their NDIS plan. It is also highly likely that when the ID NDIA implements independent assessments in our region, there will be a spike in reviewable decisions and appeals. We recommend to QPC that state funding also be applied to our advocacy work in our community on reviewable decisions and appeals to fill the gap, ensure that people have access to justice, that NDIS support needs are met, and to reduce the state's cost burden of people not gaining access to the NDIA or not having the reasonable and necessary support needs met. Moving on to the next topic now, topic four. QPC information request at page 119 of their draft report, ways in which the contribution of general practitioners to the NDIS uh, participant outcomes could be increased. 
Our advocacy of the most vulnerable people in our community has effectively increased the contribution of general practici practitioners to NDI participant outcomes by the way we practice. I'm just going to have a quick thing. Bulk billing doctors do not have the time or motivation to increase participant outcomes. All our clients have bulk billing doctors. Many of our clients are unable to articulate their needs. Bounce from bulk billing doctor to doctor, which means that the general practitioner has limited understanding or knowledge of the person's history, history or current circumstances on, in terms of NDIS matters. Once again, I refer to KD's story in Appendix 6 at page 22 of our submission. Rights and Action have found it more effective to gather all the relevant evidence then make the NDIS access request form, draft up the NDIS supporting evidence form, and then attend on the treating doctor with the client to sign off. It is at this point that where we are able to articulate to the treating doctor on behalf of the vulnerable client the outcomes to be achieved for them via their NDIS funding, i.e. physiotherapy, psychotherapy, supports, etc. In effect, we are training doctors on the NDIS lexicon, deepening their understanding of a patient's situation holistically, for example, health, living, situation, disability and, issues, and other issues to be addressed. This also alleviates the work burden on bulk billing doctors for which they do not receive payment. Rights in Action firmly believe that if we state funded for NDIS access, participation, pre-planning and planning and engagement of services for the most vulnerable people in our community with intellectual and or psychosocial disability who are unable to articulate their needs, much better outcomes will be achieved. This will lead to greater contrib contribution by general practitioners as their understanding of NDIS matters via advocacy will be increased, plus they will have a greater understanding of the person they are treating, which will reduce risk and request for review and appeal. Once again, I refer to KD's story to Appendix C at page 22 of our submission. Once again, there are many issues to be addressed for these people, not just NDIS access. A holistic approach needs to be taken to achieve outcomes which are lifelong, build capacity and are in, and are in the best interests of the person. I'm going to move on to topic five now. Uh, interactions with government services at 14 and using government institutions to support access at 14.4 of the draft report. Uh, rights and action is set out at Appendix A, case studies at pages 14 to 18 of our submission, which reflect how complex matters can be and the multiple issues to be addressed when advocating for mothers and their children with intellectual and or psychosocial disabilities particularly if child protection are involved. It is not just a matter of gaining NDIS access. It is addressing all the issues for these vulnerable people. That is housing, attending on child protection case planning meetings with the mother, arranging legal aid funding on child protection matters and assisting with the giving of instructions to lawyers. Health, education, finances, Centrelink payments, other legal matters, QCAT applications for the appointment of the Office of the Public Guardian and Public Trustee. Uh, child support, NDIS access, pre-planning and planning, NDIS internal reviews and external reviews and following up on NDIS service provision and other issues. These mothers are unable to self-advocate, articulate their needs, navigate or traverse the various government institutions, complete paperwork or bargain for their needs to achieve good outcomes for themselves and their children without advocacy. It is the diverse knowledge and skill set of the advocates together with their understanding of the various legislative frameworks and government policies that facilitates interactions with government services for these vulnerable women and their children. Thus, we know the person. This type of advocacy practice model achieves good outcomes so that those children are not under long-term child protection orders of the state and their mothers learn how to self-advocate by their advocate and also learn how to parent and be their good mothers. We are the view that via our advocacy practice models, these vulnerable mothers, uh, vulnerable mothers and their children achieve much better outcomes. And it alleviates the cost burden of state funding of child protection services and the office of the public guardian. Reduces emotional stress of mothers, reduces the trauma of children in long-term care, reduces the need for foster care, reduces the need for the children under long-term protection orders trans transitioning to the guardianship, the guardianship when they turn 18. It also ensures NDI's access for the mothers and their children and means mothers and their children can live together as a family with love in their lives. All the, all the mothers that I've acted for on child protection matters 
uh, where they've successfully had their children reunited with them. They've gone on to live very good lives and they're a lot more happier. Once again, these mothers and the children are overrepresented in the child protection system. Even if the various government institutions support access, it'll, this will not address or support all the issues faced by these mothers and children in order to lead that alive. All right, that's, I'm just going to move on to my next topic now. Uh, topic six, division of disability services between uh, government that uh, QPC box 14.3 information request. Mm -hmm. Specific adverse impacts of cost shifting outside the applied principle and tables of support. Rights and action have noticed over the last 12 months there's a pushback from the NDIA on allied health professionals like psychologists under a participant's plan with psychosocial disability. For example, referring the participant back to the treating doctor with mental health treatment plan. The issues are that the participants might already have a treating psychologist who do, do not provide therapy under a mental health treatment plan. Psychologists working with people under a mental health treatment plan are not prepared to draft up NDIS reports because there is no cost benefit and they are time poor. Under this scenario, the participant is disadvantaged by this inappropriate attempt at cost shifting from federal to state. Our recommendation is that funding for psychosocial therapy be fully funded under a, under a participant's NDIS plan. All right, let's move on to the next topic. That's just moving on to a summary now. I'm just going to wind up. It shouldn't take me very long. Um, without independent advocacy of the most vulnerable people in our community with intellectual and or psychosocial disability, they will not leave better lives and are placed at serious risk, even death. The KD and MD case studies in our submission, in our submission are examples, as is the South Australian case of Anne Marie Smith, where a woman with disability died in a chair due to her neglect and there was no independent check on service provision. It is not just NDI access, all issues impact, impacting on their lives need to be addressed to enable them to build capacity and not be placed at risk. It is important to have independent advocacy to ensure that service providers are kept in check and people with disability are not neglected. Rights in Action have, new, have made numerous submissions to the Disability Royal Commission and complaints to the NDI's Quality and Safeguards Commission around serious neglect by service providers of people with disability in our community. Simplification of the NDIS and streamlining of intergovernmental processes will not address these people's needs because they lack capacity and require informed, supported decision making to address their many complex issues. That is, they require one person to understand their life story and current situation rather than many to guide them through the issues to achieve successful outcomes. Mothers with intellectual disabilities are particularly vulnerable. They are unable to navigate multiple government services without advocacy. They have no power, find it difficult to articulate their needs or bargain for them. And many are illiterate and able to use, unable to use information technology. It is via advocacy that these mothers are empowered and learn to self-advocate and also have all the supports that they need wrapped around themselves and their children to lead good lives. And that's it for me today. Is there any questions? Thank you, Marlene. That was a very com right. comprehensive presentation. Obviously, you touched a number of uh, critical issues. Maybe I could just start mm. with a very high-level question, then we might get into some more detail. Mm. Um, obviously, you have a very uh, important role as an advocate uh, in the NDIS just wondering, you know, what the key challenges uh, are for advocates in navigating the scheme and assisting and supporting their clients. So you've raised a couple of issues there that sort of impact on client uh, outcomes. But I'm just wondering if from a very high level perspective where you find the greatest uh, issues are in the work that you well, do. Well, uh, uh, in terms of advocating on NDIS matters, it's particularly difficult for uh, when we're advocating for people with uh, intellectual and psychosocial disability. Even though we request the NDIA to be on the record, like one of my clients can hardly communicate. Um, and they they ring directly for planning meeting uh, with the client. The client doesn't know what's going on. For another client who's totally blind, he can't read any correspondence. They still self send correspondence out to his address. Um, yeah, there's an imbalance of power there when it comes to those types of people. So it would be really good from advocacy, advocacy perspective. If we are noted as um, uh, representative advocates on the record 
um, if we can include that, that we'd be contacted, be the point of contact for those people, that would be very useful in terms of being able to advocate for them and uh, have their disability needs met. And Marlene, mm. you mentioned uh, referring complaints to the Quality and Safeguards Commission. I'd be really interested mm. in your views and perspectives on how well those complaints are handled and whether those channels are working effectively. Um, well, it's my belief that there's only five uh, people at, at that commission's office and they've got a huge workload. Uh, there is a bit of pet pushback there in terms of um, advocates trying to, uh, pushing it back on advocates and other representatives to try and deal with the issue and deal with the person that's, um, um, deal with the person directly that the complaint's about. Normally we do go through that process too because that's the proper complaints process. Um, I'm starting to... <laughs> Feel that um, I would probably have better success going to the to the fair work, to fair work to make a uh, to lodge a claim against a service provider rather than the commission, the quality and safeguards commission. Mm -hmm. It seems that their framework is just more around about you know policy, um, what service providers should be doing. Um, I think it's it's not their fault. It's just under their act, they're a bit powerless to actually push things to a greater level. Uh, but we have we have got one particular service provider in our region that keeps coming up again and again. Um, we've made numerous complaints about them. I'm not quite sure what the outcome is at that moment because my colleagues have been dealing with that, that particular issue. Um, yes, that's all I can answer on that question. And you, you mentioned um, independent assessments and, and you made a comment that you would expect to be, see a spike in um, appeals as mm. a result of the introduction of, of independent assessments. What, what leads to that view? Well, it, it's based on the experience I've had with dealing on NDIS internal reviews and external reviews today. Um, I don't think an hour or three hour appointment with an independent assessor understands that person. Who's going to give that assessor all the information and background about that particular person? That's one of my concerns. I also um, note in the AAT, where I've been representing clients, that um, the AAT takes the view, if it matters a dispute, that their preference is to look at um, evidence on the record rather than a one-off NDIS um, assessment because these people may have had the same treating doctor for many years, they may have had the same therapist for many, many years. So they view that that, that material is far more important than a one-off assessment by the NDIA to try and prove the case against the participant that's getting funding. Um, yeah, I just don't think the independent assessments are going to fully realise um, um, all the clients' disability. I mean, I've got another client who had that tribe disability of um, uh, bipolar, um, bipolar MS and also um, ankylosing spondylosis. And they just didn't uh, – uh, that was – I had to have an internal review. He's denied access in the beginning. They didn't read all the material that was on the file. And then a plan issued, it didn't have the in, it had inadequate funding under the, the plan as well, so I had to do another request for internal review until the plan came out. Um, that's, that's my fear. I mean, they're not reading, they're not reading material on the record now, so, you know, I, mean, should, I, mean, I understand that's an insurance scheme um, and they've got to be financially viable for, to, you know, to, to have a lifelong effect, but um, my fear is that yeah, people's, people's a bit, their, their reasonable and necessary supports aren't going to be met. So that's what's going to lead to internal reviews, requests for internal reviews and spike. Thank, thank you. Mm. And, and you raised data issues around reporting and recording mm. of a person's disability. So mm. in your view, if those data issues were resolved, would that automatically lead to better plan outcomes for the clients that you support? Yes, I'd say so. If you'd be able to record like a dual or, or tri primary disability in one box, <laughs> rather than it being noted as a secondary disability, um, because those secondary disabilities as recorded, they don't seem to get as enough attention. I don't know what the processes are in terms internally with the NDIA when they're looking at people's um, disabilities, but they tend to, they, I think current, there's, they've currently got a list of disabilities, I think list one, list two, list three. So they just go through list one and pull out the first primary disability there and then the other two get relegated to the, or the other one gets relegated to the second disability. And then the focus at the planning meeting is on the primary disability, even though you've got evidence to say mm -hmm. that all these disabilities are impacting on this person. 
And what's your general view of the effectiveness of the planning process aside from the data issues? Do you find genuinely that they're leading to positive outcomes for participants? Yes, I do. But I know for the advocate there's normally a lot of work involved in that um, because we gather all the evidence and the way that we do achieve good outcomes is we do all the pre-planning and we actually provide that to the NDIA and also the LAC prior to the planning meeting and ask them to consider it before we go ahead with the planning meeting. Mm. And that makes that's, that makes the process a lot more fluid and usually achieves good outcomes for the, for the person as well. So mm. one of the recommendations in the draft report is that, that planners... Uh, and LACs have a, a greater coaching role in those planning conversations, particularly around you know assisting participants to set goals. Do you see value in that approach? Well, I'm concerned because the NDIS is an insurance scheme. Um, it's, there's a conflict of interest there, and also with the LACs, the LACs are funded by by um, federal government as well, or by the NDIA. Um, my view at the moment is it's a very adversarial system. I think that's part of the economic climate as well. And with, yeah, I just I just don't think that's a good idea, especially for people with intellectual disabilities and psychosocial disability. You really need someone there to advocate and stand up for them. Um, their needs aren't going to be met. I think, as I said, I just think it's a conflict of interest for <laughs> the NDI to be coaching people on what they, what, what they view as their support needs, reasonable and necessary support needs. And in the experience that you've had in, in the planning process, Marlene, do you find that the plans map well to participant goals? Not always. Sometimes they lead to internal reviews. Uh, sometimes, the, I think one thing that keeps coming up time and time again is that a lot of my clients will never work. They can't work. They don't have capacity to work. They're um, on a disability support pension. And when the first, even though you've got all the evidence there that's stating that, that they'll never participate, there'll never be an economic participation of these people. There seems to be, there always seems to be some sort of goal, even if it's the third goal, that they'll find employment in the future. I'll be assisted to, to, to find that. And it's just an unrealistic expectation. And it would be good if those people could be identified. <laughs> we would cut that issue out. And do you have any views on the role of support coordinators in helping your clients find the services that they have identified in their plans? Uh, we, ha we have a market that's undersupplied here in Cairns. There's a great disparity around um, different service provider organisations in terms that some have a very narrow view of the role, some have a very broad view of the role. I think it's still that definitely needs to be clearly defined. I find some support coordinators are fantastic. They'll go over and above um, what they're expected and you've got others that'll just clearly set the line and won't deviate. And as an advocate, that's very difficult for me as well because I, I can't keep advocating for the client on certain matters like finances, but that's a tricky area as well because it's a conflict of interest for the service provider to be dealing with the client's, um, mm. the client's finances. That's where we normally get a guardian or a trustee appointed. Um, yeah, but yeah. So, I guess how do I answer that? Yes, that's very, as I said, it's very broad. It's either their roles are interpreted broadly or very, very, very narrowly. And, and that, the lack of experience as well, that lack of experience of um, mm -hmm. coordinators up in our region. Mm -hmm. And in your particularly, particularly Indigenous, <laughs> Indigenous right. support coordinators. Okay. And just heading back to your presentation for a moment, you you, you talked about the difficulty that mothers with an intellectual disability have in accessing the scheme. Um, mm. So in, in your presentation, you mentioned the importance of advocacy. Is there anything else that needs to be done to support mothers with an intellectual disability outside of advocacy services? Uh, well, I think I was, I was thinking about that and I, the, the, the problem is with these mothers uh, with intellectual disability, they need guiding through the whole process because there's so many issues to be addressed. They really need strong advocacy and they, they learn from that advocacy. Um, I mean, they've got, so, I mean I've got, they've got so many different issues. You know, they might be going off to a DV service, then, then they might go off to the Women's Centre. The Women's Centre might only, you know, run with, their, with them for three months and then they've got to take on the next client. 
it's just no consistency. The only way that you can really deal with it is that they have to have a consistent person in their life to build the support and then let them go. Um, I was thinking in terms of how would we would get referrals, the more referrals, would, we would be engaging with um, the Women's Centre, the DV services, um, for referrals for those women to our office as well. It's difficult with child safety making the referral because mothers don't want to admit that they've got a disability a lot of the time. They're frightened um, that if they are shown to have a disability, then they'll, they'll be used against them to say that they've got poor, poor parenting skills. So they really need someone that's sort of on their side to speak up for them. Mm. And Marlene, what's been the experience of um, advocacy during COVID? Were there any particular challenges that you faced during that period? Well, we still, we, we, we viewed ourselves as, as a um, essential service. So we were still seeing clients. One particular client, which is KD in the submission, um, he was totally blind and he's in an over 50, 55's retirement village. There was a COVID lockdown out there and he didn't have a safety plan. There was nowhere for him to go. Um, at the time, he was only getting two hours of hack service per week. Uh, so I had to, I had to drive up a safety plan, <laughs> safety plan for him and there was nowhere else for him to go mm. outside of the village. Um, it's not the job of um, it's not the job of um, safety services either to do that. Um, and I had to. With the other difficult thing was the on-site managers. Uh, this particular client unable to navigate to the communal dining room, uh, but they had to shut down the communal dining room during COVID and deliver meals to their room. But they couldn't deliver to Ken because they would have had to go inside his room, and. Mm -hmm which meant they could only just leave the mills outside his door and it doesn't tend to open his door very much. So it's just bang, bang, here's your food on the ground outside. And that was pretty horrible. Um, so some practical challenges there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got over it. We got over it in the end. This is a really good story, actually. <laughs> this is a <Seth> story, <laughs> one of my pet, pet stories. And did you mm. move online at all in delivery of your services in terms of conducting meetings online? Oh, only with um, only with um, other stakeholders like the Queensland Alliance of Mental Health. Um, right, but not with clients all our, directly. All, not, no, definitely no. not. My, my, none of my clients would be able to do that. Mm. They don't have information technology. They can't use it. Mm. Um, that's a particular area that I'm concerned about too in terms of crisis. There's all this information technology out there for people, but um, people with intellectual disability or blind and deaf, they get they miss out. They've, they've, yeah, I think one way of probably identifying those people would, if they would be at risk, is by um, their disability, sending disability a support pension record. Mm -hmm. And so in they were given high priority on the list when, in terms of crisis. Mm -hmm. So uh, a chapter in our draft report looks at the interaction of um, of services, as you've identified in the presentation. Um, there are some issues around the, the fact that some of the clients that you deal with require multiple services across multiple agencies. How well, right. how well is that coordination and information sharing happening at the moment? Well, there's demarcation lines. I know I can give you a scenario. One particular mother that um, I acted for, which is um, MD, in the submission is that um, she had her two children removed under a 12-month order. So... Basically, that meant um, child safety were the guardians of her children and then I got the guardian appointed and he was the guardian for making mum's decisions, but he couldn't make any decisions about the children because the children were under <laughs> child safety. And then so that demarcation line, so yeah, the guardian wasn't attending on any uh, child case planning meetings, which is vital because you have to pull everything together and... Um, and get then the support coordinator should be there at the meetings as well because child safety want to know uh, what supports are in place for mum in terms of NDIS and then you've got to coordinate the children uh, that particular case had a different support coordinator for the, the kids and then there's a different support coordinator for mum had to get that all together um, there's legal issues as well that the guardian probably should have been aware of um, information sharing is not particularly good. The other issue as well is that um, 
child safety get uh, specialist reports, which is skewed towards um, removing the children in their favour, you know, removing the children um, from their mothers and, to, and around their lack of capacity to parent. And then under an NDIS plan where I've been involved getting um, NDIS access and participation for mothers, the purpose of getting those reports is to maximise funding. So you've got two different purposes of the, you know, of the reports and um, child safety are always keen to get those reports as well. Um, but it's very difficult. Um, I, I never give the reports. I just always give what the recommendations are and the schedule of supports to be, um, that the mother's going to be getting to enable the kids to be re- reunited. So mm-hmm. there's that difficulty of information sharing there as well. Mm. Mm. And Marlene, how well do plans take into account the um, responsibilities of mothers with an intellectual disability? Do they provide extra support for those parenting responsibilities? Yes, they do, but um, I mean, except that it's a special criteria that mum does have an intellectual disability and she's got to develop her parenting skills. Um, they do provide that support, but you have to have oh, that particular case I was just telling you about was really difficult because over two years, um, the, the children were, uh, sorry, over 12 months, the, the children were reunited with her. They started off with one day a week and then three days a week and then five days a week and then finally seven. And every time we had to get a fresh OT report based on the children being in her care either one day a week, three days a week, to just to shore up the support. So, um, And the other issue that we have in our, our region too is a lot of um, service providers aren't prepared to, um, especially with babies, they're not, they're not, they don't want to pick them up and nurse them because if they, they feel that, that, you know, if anything happens, they're at risk then as well. So that's a challenge that needs to be overcome too. Um, mm, uh, there's some people that do it and some that don't. Oh, <laughs> and you've got to, you, <laughs> and you've got to have, you've got to have, um, you know, got to have boosters in the car and things oh. like that as well in the, in the support car. Are there any other areas of, of service deficits facing your clients in that particular cohort? Uh, well, it needs to be more in-home support. I mean, even with child safety involved, they've got all these theoretical parenting programs. Like my mum, that mum with the three kids, I mean, she's busy being a mother um, without having to sort of, you know, pick up all the kids, drop some of them off at school and then go to this theoretical parenting course that she's not going to get. It's the in-home supports that are really important Mm -hmm. so that they can build capacity Mm -hmm. around their parenting skills. And they basically don't have the time. If they're involved in child safety, there's so many expectations placed upon them. They've got, you know, they might have child safety coming out to see them once a week. They might have the new people from the new team program coming out to see them also. And the expectation that they go to these parenting programs, plus they're trying to look after children, take them to school. So some of the expectations are unrealistic, I think. Mm. and place extra pressure on the family, which is not needed. Mm. Well, look, Marlene, thank you very much for your submission and for joining us today from from CAMS. And uh, certainly we'll be sort of following up and reflecting on those issues when it comes time to finalise our report. So thanks again. I look forward to seeing it. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time today. Okay, I'll stop sharing now and leave you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.